Edward, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. So I've got to start with the news that was announced this week. Your company, Zero Hash, has raised $105 million. How does it feel to have raised that amount? Look, it's obviously a, a great validator and, you know, fundraising it should be a tool. Obviously, right now, the media and everybody focuses a lot on fundraisers just because that's the ecosystem that we live in. But, you know, at the end of the day, fundraising is the fuel. You know, when you speak to people who have actually gone through these fundraisers, they're complex. They're relatively, you know, you, sometimes you feel like, are we going to get to the end of this? And, and that's just the way it goes. So by the end, it's probably more personal. It's probably more relief. But also, it's just nice to get back um, to, you know, focusing as much time as possible on the actual business. We're fortunate that, you know, we, we're now a profitable business, even if we, you know, scale the way we want to scale, we'll probably remain a, a profitable business. So for us, it wasn't, you know, this life and death piece, but it was more a validator, the strategic aspects, and also just as a B2B business, having a stronger balance sheet is a really important thing to be able to close larger and larger clients because clients want to know that you are going to be there for a long time. And so that was what's exciting more so than, you know, the, the number. So yeah, absolutely. And I love, um, hear you saying that because this podcast is also about really going beyond the hype and I would say that's what the the media is very focused on and what you're telling is not oh we've arrived (laughs) but really it's about building (laughs) and it's uh yeah more fuel to an already profitable business so very good very sober answer and uh, so going back to your Mm -hmm. background can we get a bit of your, you know, story? I know you're from the UK, but then studied in the US, which is an interesting story. Can you take us from there in your the beginning of your entrepreneurial and career? Yeah, came to the US. I was fortunate to be able to come to MIT for, for, for my grad studies. Really, the driving force was, you know, America was it was interesting, you know, and I honestly thought I was going to come for the 18 months of the program and I was going to go back. But I was fortunate that... We could found off, you know, founded off the first business I was involved in straight out of MIT. And, you know, I, I don't think I would have been able to do that. Look, I, I think name kudos can mean something, but a lot of it is to some degree, it, it can open some doors. My dad always says that uh, cream and something else also, also, also rise to the top. So it doesn't mean anything in kind of anything that you're incredibly smart or anything, but it did open doors. And what I did find with the American university or college system is that people feel very involved and very engaged with their alma mater. And so you could get this access. You could say, hey, I graduated and people will talk to you. In the UK, I went to Warwick or as the Americans would butcher it, but you know, it, there's not the same sense of loyalty. And so that was what was really interesting to me. I, I didn't know that before I came, but I do think for me personally, it was a great trajectory. And it also gave me time to think. If you go to somewhere like MIT and you don't reconsider what you want to do, I always say, you're doing it wrong. Don't worry so much about your GPA. No one cares. But actually use it as an experience to question, what do you want to do? And that for me was really the value add. And can you talk us through the steps that led to zero hash? And from what I gathered, it's a product that became a business. You're absolutely right. So the initial genesis story of zero hash is that the business started as effectively an exchange. And this was right before the crypto winter, so to speak. And so the thesis was, let's build an exchange. But then as we started, you know, we were live, we were doing tens of millions of dollars a day. Um, We realized one, the economics weren't that attractive, but two, we were hitting this, you know, this cap almost in terms of we were stagnating as a business. And thinking it through, we said, if, crypto is going to become mainstream, if that's our thesis, are we best positioned as a direct-to-customer business? Or is the back office infrastructure that we built for our own business actually the value proposition? And is that the better play? Because if crypto is going to become mainstream, do we think it's going to become everywhere? Is it going to be with every bank account that you have, every you know brokerage firm that you have? The answer is yes. So why don't we position ourselves in that business, that B2B business, and position ourselves very similar as a bank as a service or brokerage as a service, what we call digital assets as a service. So that was the genesis. You're absolutely right. It was almost an internal product, an internal service, realizing that wasn't the play, shutting down the B2C business and actually going to zero revenue again, and then pushing 
fully onto Zerohash. Wow. It's very inspiring because you said that you may have been stagnating, but given the timeline, I did to, you, you didn't stagnate for many years. I see you graduated just a few years ago. So it was a yeah, bold and, and quick pivot. And before we go into more details into zero hash, what's, where's the name from? Yeah. So zero hash comes from effectively finality, you know, when a Bitcoin confirms as a series of zero hashes. And so effectively there's finality, there's settlement, things have moved. And so that's really what we do. So that's where the name comes from. All right. And therefore the mission you said is, um, enabling crypto to become mainstream. Is that what you have in mind? We, what we mean by that is we want effectively the way to, this is what I sometimes say is we want zero hash to be the biggest crypto company that you've never heard of. And by that, I'm obviously not fintech nerds, but I'm thinking the end customer in a similar way to, you know, Plaid. Everyone uses Plaid, but most people don't know about Plaid. And we want to enable every single existing financial services company, and indeed every company to offer a digital asset product, whether that be buy and sell, whether that be crypto rewards, whether that be building out and enabling them to launch their NFT strategy, interacting with Web 3.0, the metaverse, you know, all these kind of big buzzwords. We want to power all of that and make it really for people to have crypto as part of their portfolio. And more importantly, lower the threshold and lower the boundaries for innovators, maybe as a startup or maybe innovation within an existing firm to launch digital asset products. And that's because crypto is highly regulated. It's highly complex and there's a lot of barriers. And so our business effectively lowers those barriers from a multi-year process to a, you know, multi-day process in the most simple senses. We're going to get back to that, but first I'd want to go to, to zero hash behind the scenes. So it's a simple proposition for the clients. So the, at the moment it's mainly, it seems like a lot of brokerage, but not just, but what does that imply? What did you have to build? And I'm just going to say as a preface, when I think of the investment stack, it's a very complicated and long stack from trading part to then settling custody, blah, blah, blah. So can you tell us a little bit how you remove that complexity? Yeah. So what we effectively allow people to do is to build a digital asset product. So let's say an investment app, for example. And they allow you to trade stocks. What we allow them to do is to offer crypto side by side to the stock trading product on the same front end that clients are used to. And so effectively our clients are the front end interface for the client. Everything on the back end from the data that is presented to the end client, the liquidity, the custody of crypto, the legal movement, the Custody also from a legal perspective, i.e. where do those assets sit in terms of balance sheet? They, most people don't want crypto to sit on their balance sheet, specifically, especially if they're a publicly listed company. So we take on all of those different pieces and allow people to effectively offer the exact same experience that they may already have in you know, equities trading or on the brokerage, or, you know, on the banking side and offer crypto side by side. More importantly, what we allow, and this is maybe getting a little into the weeds, but what we allow on the brokerage side as well is if a client has $100 in their account, for example, we allow that client effectively to buy $100 of stock or $100 worth of crypto. And what that means is that they have a single fiat account and they don't have to move the assets like they have to move them to Coinbase, for example. So you have a, it's much more capital efficient and seamless for the, so that's effectively what, what we provide. Great. So can I ask? How does that work in particular in terms of liquidity if you're not an exchange? Yeah. <clears throat> so the way it works, and we actually allow people to source their liquidity outside of us, but most clients now will take our liquidity. Effectively, what we do is we are principal to the transaction mm -hmm. and then we effectively hedge. So it's legally George versus zero hash versus and then we hedge out that trade against different liquidity providers. So that's how it works. We're effectively almost like a principal dealer. Understood. And I suppose for custody, it's a similar thing. Yeah, we custody the assets. What people mean by custody, who, who has control over the, over the assets. So if it's multi-signature, who has the keys? 
Um, you know, and if it's MPC, like who has the, you know, who has the key shards to be able to move, move those assets that, yeah, we are the custodian. We're also regulated yes. as such. And yeah, that's the custody piece. Um, okay. So now I understand how it works. Yeah. So indeed you're taking care of all of that and therefore yeah, it's a simple thing for the end clients. Exactly. And it's all through API. Not through API. So we provide the API infrastructure and the client and what the client sees is the front end same brand and everything that they're used to today. So the clients, so let's say uh, we, we have a few clients, Testy Trade, Money, Line, etc. So what do they focus on? Do they just focus on the interface and the end client experience? Yeah, crypto has to feel part of the native customer experience. And, you know, ultimately that's, that's, that's the, hard, the hard bit in many ways. And it's also about integrating the product into a seamless experience such that it doesn't feel like a bolt-on. You know, that's what a client said to me the other day. I need it not to feel mm -hmm. like a bolt-on. I need it to feel like a native part of the product. And that's why a lot of people are starting to use a lot more than just our buy and sell endpoints. It's, for example, the ability to do roundups. Uh, you mentioned Moneyline, for example, the ability that, you know, they offer this service, the ability to do much more peer-to-peer -peer transfers, withdraw to a smart contract and um, to be able to purchase an NFT. So it's embedded within the entire client experience. I think that's what really clients focus on. Right. Let, let, let's get more into that. So first of all, what tokens do you support? And I know that um, you've announced you'll be expanding this, but just to give us an idea. Yeah, we support about 40 different tokens today. We will be supporting 80 by the end of this year. Big things are tokens that are layer two or infrastructure that's layer two and building tokens on, or, or, you know, or supporting tokens on that. I think multi-chain support the stable coins is going to be really important as well. You know, if you we're looking today, if you've seen what's happened to ETH gas spikes, it's a really challenging proposition to say that Ethereum-based stable coins is the payment mechanism for the future. And then there's a bunch of metaverse token that we're going to be supporting as well. Also, the reality is this space changes at a million miles an hour. So the largest 20 coins that we have today, for example, a portion of those will be in the largest 20 coins in a year's time. But I think it will be, and you've seen that year on year. So there's a lot of change. This infrastructure is constantly changing. And you will need to ensure that you're providing a token choice that is relevant to, to your customers. Sure. Understood. So now let's go a bit more. You already mentioned some of the use cases. So let's go back to this, uh, as we've mentioned in the roundup. Can, can you tell me a bit more about, I intuitively understand, but can you tell me in details how that could work? Yeah, so roundups is a really simple, and I think it's actually a really interesting thing for um, people who don't necessarily invest. So that could be somebody who, you know, doesn't earn the highest salary, but the reality, and, and some groups, I think it's really important. And, and you know, in, in the US where I'm based, 70% of Americans don't have $1,000 to pay for something that, you know, is an emergency case. These people aren't investing in the stock market. They're not investing in crypto. And so this answer isn't just about crypto, right? Just investment as a whole, and crypto should be a portion of that. People aren't investing in a really seamless way. So, for example, what roundups actually mean is I buy a coffee for $3.49, 51 cents will be used to round up and purchase a portion of a digital asset. If people don't have a portfolio, and this is like, you know, these are fractional pieces which really come about and become more meaningful. There will be a greater wealth divide, right? If you've seen what's happened in the stock market, if you've seen what's happened in the crypto market over the last three years, if you weren't invested, you effectively got poorer and the richer got richer. And, you know, I don't want to beat the drum about, you know, these are, these are life-saving things, I but I do think it's really, really important that everybody is an investor in a way that is responsible for themselves. And this is a really good way for people to invest in digital asset market if they are not, you know, if they don't have, you know, a savings account that they can put a portion of their portfolio in. I, I think people sometimes, you know, forget that. Yeah, no, it's a concept that I love so much because I fully agree with what you said about, let's call it the inequality factor to, to, to make it short, which typically the thesis that you need a certain level of income to be able to invest and those that invest I see their, I've seen their wealth grow faster than, than just those that, that rely on income. But the, the classic, yeah. I think, approach to that, try savings, better spending habits, et cetera, education on how to invest. But it's such a 
tedious process. Yeah. And also some people want to, not everyone wants to be fully in, involved in this activity of investment. And therefore it could play a very important part in the future of investing. Agreed. And I want to try to develop later about what also it could mean in terms of retails and things like that. But can we go through, just to give us an overview of the other use cases. So I see there's a testy trade, one, one of the people I know, and they're a brokerage client, right? Correct. They're a brokerage. Actually, they just got acquired IG Group, which obviously is, a, is one of the largest players in the UK, Australia, um, and other parts of the world. But yeah, effectively what they provide. And it's been really interesting to see the behavior. And this is what they've seen is really interesting for, the, for their customers is their customers have really engaged them that within six months, almost 25% of existing clients traded to crypto, traded just to assets, which is meaningful. And then secondly, the engagement of those clients has, it has increased, especially with equities trading, right? There's periods where you can't trade in most cases. Crypto is 24-7 market. And so people's um, engagement with the platform that has also increased. And so it's been interesting to see that kind of behavior and it's really validated their decision. At this point, offering a crypto product, I wouldn't even say that innovative, <laughs> right? We've got so many data points, whether you look at Robin Hood's financials, you look at eToro's financials in the brokerage space, and it's pretty clear that clients want this product. And if you don't have it, clients are going elsewhere. So the product is really simple trade they offer about 25 different assets a subset of our assets and they you can trade that side by side with your equities prop with the equities products that they offer today yes and i really like the story from what i saw it started as a content platform and if we look as well another very interesting and innovating use case is deserve it's a, mm -hmm. a credit card could you tell us a bit about that yeah, they, they call themselves credit card, credit card uh, service. Yeah. So they power some really large players, for example, M1, actually now the Chicago-based firm, or or some really interesting kind of wealth management platform doing some really interesting things. Yeah, they offer now a credit card. And it's this part of this kind of theme that people are doing more and people want to do more and more in one place. And that's why, you know, credit card as a service exists. This is why Deserve exists. And the beauty of this, and talking about kind of a seamless product, is what Deserve can now offer their clients through Zero Hash is they'll issue a credit card. And what can seamlessly happen is you can then use the rewards, right? That the credit cards offer, which is effectively just using interchange fees to create um, rewards. You can then do that to automatically get crypto. So you can get, for example, 2% cashback in Bitcoin, 2% cash back in Ethereum or whatever else. And so that's what clients can offer. So every time you use your credit card versus you getting some points that you never use, especially right now when people aren't traveling, you can get Bitcoin. Um, and you know, that's, that's the offer. Again, what I find fascinating, like look at the wider range consequences of that is a adoption of crypto. Suddenly you've got it in your portfolio and you haven't really gone through the whole the rabbit hole of uh, which exchange you go, yeah. et cetera. But the same story about investing, it's the most seamless, less effort type of investing. In fact, you're not in the, you, you're not uh, doing the effort of investing, but you're becoming an investor because you've got assets which are tradable on top of that in your portfolio. Yep. See, this goes back to the point. It's. Almost no effort investing, broadening your portfolio and, you know, creating value, hopefully for yourself. Yeah. Now, this is what I found wonderful about the embedded. So, like I said, we mentioned, we spoke to DriveWealth earlier and yours. There's some investors who are going to, let's say, lean in and be very actively focused and they can still do that. For example, at Testy Trade, some others will be more relaxed and some yeah. do not want to spend a moment investing but they still have the benefit of building somehow a portfolio while shopping. Yep, exactly. and look, <laughs> yeah, while shopping, creating value for themselves. It's what I'm excited about is that there's certain crypto cards that have existed. And when you look at the numbers there, the performance of them, and when you look at groups like BlockFi and others, which are literally just credit card reward cards, you know, it, the performance is incredible. And when you look at the Square Cash card, you can get cash back on 
restaurants and, and coffee and you know, it's part of their boost infrastructure. The performance is absolutely mind-blowing. People want, you know, it's not that it's mutually exclusive, right? There's not, you can passively invest and you can actively invest. And it's just part of diversifying the way people are investing and the types of assets people are investing in. Yes. And I think that links us to the Web3 and the metaverse. But before that, I just want to ask a few questions about your own expansion and and what I, what are your next step in terms of marketing and yeah, how do you plan to further expand your reach? Yeah, you know, part of that is is, is hiring the, the the right people. We we actually just made our our first uh, you know marketing hire in about three months. Which ago. which is interesting um, because it's also so it's uh, still... typically it's at Series A or something like that. But for you, it was because yeah. product led growth got you that thus far. Yeah, exactly. I think we focus very much on the product. And I would say that in crypto, there's this quadrant of um, hype on one line and then um, actually doing something on another line. I, I prefer to be in the quadrant that we were in, which is doing something meaningful when interesting, but not necessarily making enough noise about it versus the inverse, which is not doing much and doing making a lot of hype, which unfortunately is why some people are sometimes pessimistic about the crypto. But yeah, also just things move very quickly. We raised our Series C three months ago. So... You know, it's a big portion of our business. A lot of the growth has been organic. A lot of it's been um, word of mouth. And that's great. I think, you know, our clients, if you can make them advocates for what you have, that's a powerful business. But yeah, we're, we're scaling our, 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 our team. You know, we want to be, you know, we're not going to win every deal. But what I say is I want to be in the room. And that's the important thing, both from a sales perspective, both from a marketing perspective. And, you know, that's the critical part. And, you know, the challenge for us and challenge for our marketing and, and communications and, and growth teams is that's the metric for success in many ways. Were we in the room? And, you know, did we have a fair shot at the deal? Mm. And I think if we can do that, we will win most of the time. And your clients are also your investors, which is makes them real advocates because they have every reason to push their success. How does that work in terms of the commercial dynamic or is it not, I guess it's very beneficial and I love the concept of stakeholders being customers, etc., which is also a crypto thing, but it's in a different way. It is great. Personally, I love having investors that are entrepreneurs themselves, ultimately. I think the key point though, anytime you have clients as investors is one, to be really clear, on what their information rights are and what they're mm. not. And number two, keep them as minority shareholders. The reason for that is because you don't, you know, the customer base that you have that are investors, that shouldn't be your entire customer base. And so you need to make sure they're competitive and we work with, and that we rely on work with everyone's competitors. I want to serve every single neobank. I want to serve every single brokerage firm. I want to serve every single buy now, pay later firm. So we rely on trust and we're always clear on that, but the way that you have to take on investors that are clients, and it's super, super beneficial in so many ways, but you've got to have those guardrails. I think that's critically important. And looking at expansion, so you mentioned that yeah, now potentially every business in the future could uh, offer crypto as a service. So far, I see your clients are financial in the financial sector, right? Could we imagine something where retailer, Nike was already in the metaverse, offer crypto as a service and you, I had some, I, I was imagining something where you buy, I don't know, a Nike polo and you get rewards in some kind of Nike token, or that would work very well with a team. You buy the jersey of your team and you get their, you get their token or something. What you're saying is, 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 is exactly how big brands are starting to think about digital assets. It's interesting. So this week we had, you know, a meeting with one of the largest food and beverage companies in the world, looking at crypto, both from an NFT loyalty perspective, but also just crypto as part of the loyalty program, potentially. The breadth of customers that we're now talking to, and you know, some of, some of this I can't sure, sure. disclose, but in the coming weeks, we'll be disclosing non-financial services companies that have moved into the digital asset space in some way. And it's typically through rewards or through positioning around the metaverse and NFT space. And I think what's fascinating around brands is, you know, I was told the other day that there was a Berkshire bag that sold for more money in the metaverse than the actual bag retails for in the physical world. That's incredible. When you look at the concerts that are going on 
in the metaverse and the number of I, 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 you know the number of people that will start attending these things it's going to grow and so it is a wave that every brand nike is very well positioned for it and you know i hadn't thought about all those different pieces about even with the, the clubs even it gives you that distribution you know i think it's incredibly exciting no absolutely i think what we can talk about you know when we think about the metaverse or like living online and things like that and yes. And then also in Pro 3, if we say, oh, okay, you have a key to all your online activities, I think that's particularly exciting. And um, mm -hmm. that brought me to, I lost in my thoughts about uh, the, the sports team and stuff. You got, yeah, you got like, excited. Like, like, I, I, I love that. Yes, no. Okay. What, what I wanted to say, I think as, as it's more a remark than a question, but just because as today, there's a bit of a, uh, there's a correction in, in crypto, I think. What that shows is that now the general public is, I think we're past the tipping point and it doesn't matter if uh, crypto or, or Bitcoin drops by whatever percent it, it drops. It's something that if the mainstream brands and not just the financial, not just the people who trade, uh, find utility into that, then I guess for it's we're one step really into what we call the metaverse, although I don't always love the concept. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. Because it's bridging. I've talked to another, um, another guest on the podcast about, she was saying, oh, it's all about bridging the, the, the digital and the non-digital. People still have assets, which are mostly non-digital. Yeah. And she was talking about it from an institutional point of view. But from what I gather, we're not talking about how to do it. Well, from a very individual and personal point of view, and even for people who are not into crypto. I, that's exactly it. I mean, I think one of the things that we, you know, that I'm most excited about is <clears throat> around this bridging. When you think about Web3.0, you think about NFTs, it's pretty complex to do today, right? To actually buy an NFT is pretty complex and people are very interested in it, but how they do that, is, is needs to be e simplified. So one of the things I'm most excited about is traditional payment rails acting with zero hash as a bridge. What I mean by that is if you want to buy, um, say an Ethereum based or Solana based or a Polygon based NFT, most clients don't want to think about that. Most clients don't care about that, but you have to interact with the smart contract. You have to buy, for example, Ethereum and it has to be sent. If you can simplify that and you can partner with some of the world's largest payment processes, it makes it now seamless and easy for anybody to buy an NFT. And it's that bridge that we service. We're not a payment group, right? We don't, you know, we don't focus on credit cards, debit cards, ACH, Apple Pay. There's incredibly large and successful companies doing that. Where we fit in and where we're incredibly complementary and where we are working is around that bridging point, around those metaverse or NFT pieces, because there has to be an interaction with digital assets in that flow. And that's critically important. It's a requirement. It's not a nice to have or an opinion thing. You have to interact, but most people don't want to think about that. And that's the bridge. Yeah. And I would say almost, it could almost go even further because now there's so much hype about NFTs, ownership economy and stuff like that. And many of us, including <laughs> me, we're, we're going through the rabbit hole and, and playing around with it. But really, I think if you look at yeah. the the utility of the NFT for a more, even more general public, it's not about what's called NFT. It's about, oh, can I own something that is very yeah. dear to me, which is whatever, my football team, my, my brand or something like that. Eventually, I think when we stop talking about NFTs and Ethereum, the metaverse, that's when it's uh, probably going to be happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got this from open banking. We've I've been really involved in open banking. I think like, okay, when people start talking, thinking about open banking, just interact it with Slimusly, which is a fintech thing. There's not, yes. there's, there's more than fintech nerds in the, in the world. The revolution will really happen when we talk and so stop talking about that. Exactly. It, it's taking something from niche to, to mainstream. That's really exciting. And I think that's something that we can, you know, further think about and perhaps it's for a second episode. We'll conclude <laughs> on that as it's a really a meaningful purpose for your company and a meaningful, you know, mm -hmm. trend, I think, in the investment world and beyond. Yeah. So thank you very much. I just want to ask a couple of questions to finish. And first of all, first one question about how do you invest personally? Yeah, pretty, 
straightforward <laughs> in, in, in some ways. I are very probably over leveraged in, in, in a risky asset, which is the startup. Some things that I do that maybe are interesting is, for example, you know, we live in a world with incredibly low interest rates. And so I put a portion of my and effectively I convert it into stable coin and then I leverage different platforms. And actually, you know, we hope to offer this to more and more of our existing platforms as well. It's high yield. So basically there's centralized lending that exists in crypto. I lend it, I'm effectively lending it to a platform who then lends it out. Similar to how a stock repo market will work. And then there's DeFi. These two things are very different. And, you know, there is a risk involved in in both of those. And you you need to think carefully about that. But, you know, for example, earning 6% on USD on a platform um, such as TradeStation that we help power. I think is incredibly attractive. And so things like that, I perceive as relatively low risk, but um, really interesting to generate, you know, more than 0.4% of something sitting in a bank account, if if you're lucky to get that. So those are things I'm interested Mm. in. in, 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 in That that brings us to the DeFi mullet. So crypto at the back and traditional (laughs) finance. And and, okay, it's for another episode, but I I think I just saw some news about a fintech that was offering 4% API API white because of the stable con mechanism in the back. I saw it yesterday. That's 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 cu- yeah, Perfect. that's cu- yes, that's um, one of the most yeah, one of the most interesting neo banks in the space. I actually the founders there are incredible. They've they've actually been involved and actually if you look at the backstory there, it's one of the most interesting stories as a fintech. And I think they've really clear of what their mission and yeah, I'm super excited for what they're doing in the space. And Trevor, the CTO there, I think is one of the deepest thinkers about how you leverage DeFi in a traditional financial setting. They have millions of customers and how they think about it from a risk perspective and from a productization perspective. You know, I think it's a great, it will be a great case study. Anyone interested in really should look at what Trevor <laughs> is saying more so than the me. The invitation to the podcast is uh, being sent <laughs> very soon as we speak. <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome. You have a last... Uh, I look forward to that one. Um, a quick last question, and maybe you want to add anything on your side, but I like to ask uh, people, uh, what would they do if they were to choose a different career path? Yeah, I probably would have um, gone into, and maybe one day I will still, I- I'm super interested in, you know, foreign policy and those types of pieces. And so actually almost the complete reverse of entrepreneurship is going to work for government. But I think that was actually my, I was super interested in my thesis at MIT was actually on terrorist financing. And so I was very interested in going to work in effectively financing and, and figuring out if you can adjust, because everything, everything relies on money, including terrorists, including organizations that we don't like. If you can understand that process, I think you can make real change. You've got to cut it off, right? If you arrest people, if there's an economic incentive still to go back. So you have to change the fundamental economics. So that's my thing at MIT was writing about terrorist financing, Taliban financing in, in Afghanistan. And so that was going to be my mind. So very different. Yes. Very interesting. Edward, it's been an absolute pleasure. We've learned so much. So I just want to wish you really all the best uh, to you and the Zero Hash team. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more from what, what you're building in the future. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much.